Thank you for joining us in this webinar. This is the Financial Foundations, and this is our fourth quarter of 2018 uh, webinar. And I'm Jeff Pospisil, the Executive Director of Finance. And I'm Sherry Meister, the Director of the Dakota's United Methodist Foundation, and we're glad to be here today. And this topic, we decided to tie this in. This is uh, coming out just a little bit after Halloween, so we did a Halloween edition, and ours is uh, Fear of the Finance Committee. And uh, Finance Committee people may not realize this, but pastors and new people coming onto the Finance Committee, there's a lot of anxiety, and there's a lot of fears, and some of them are um, maybe even justified, but there's ways that we can work together, because how I see I see the finance committee and then the pastoral leadership kind of like the the pedals of your car, where the pastor and the staff uh, and probably even the church board should bring the vision, which is like the gas pedal. But then the finance committee usually brings the brake, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, you try to drive a vehicle without one of these pedals and see what happens. If you have just all gas, you're going to crash. If you just have all brake, you're not going to crash, but you're not going to go anywhere. So, and then the other one uh, is a clutch, and I don't know what that is. And uh, maybe it's the UMW. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> or you. <laughs> we'll call it you. So. I would hope the clutch wasn't. Either one of those groups. Uh, <laughs> fine. <laughs> it's the Presbyterian. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to address what we saw as the three biggest or most common fears when addressing the finance committee. And the first one is that there's no vision for the future. And really, when you go out, walk, walk into the finance committee, it's all about well, can we keep the doors open this year? Can we, you know, manage our funds and, and have enough money left over at the end of the year just to keep going for the next year? And it's always, and there's no vision about um, how we're going to change the community, how we're going to, and that's that's the fear of pastors when they walk in, that it's just all about currently now and managing decline or managing uh, kind of stagnation. Well, and how many of you have felt like one of these people at this finance committee and that some of the people have been on forever and that um, you felt that maybe you have been asked to be on the finance committee because of your background and you've sat on just this committee forever. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to revitalize the finance committee and maybe some of the other committees within your church. So it's getting the right people at the finance table. And some of you have maybe read the book, um, Good to Great by Jim Collins, and it's getting the right people on the bus. And if you think about having the right people there to help you, um, instead of playing nominations bingo when your group um, comes together to put their nominating committees together, Jeff and I are calling it nominations bingo. You want to fill that card. But is that card being filled with the right people? Are we doing it just because they might have an interest in the finance committee? Or do they really bring something to your committee that can take your group to the next step? The characteristics of an effective committee are the position of power. Are there are enough players on your committee that are the key players of your church. Do they see the vision? Do they see the opportunities? And do you have various points of view, or does everybody come with um, the same point of view in, the, in their stopping process or progress? Yeah. And um, or do you have people on there that have a very definite point of view that are not allowing other people to share their ideas and their visions and their hopes for your church? And then do you have people on your committee that are credible? Are they respected within the church? And do they have the expertise to um, visit with others and get them on board as well of what the vision of your church is? And then, again, do you have that leadership? And do you have that ability to drive a change process? Can I? Uh, yeah. One of the things I think about is you get appointed – to a committee because you are a leader. You don't become a leader when you get appointed to a committee. 
I mean, that's one of the mistakes that people think is, oh, I'll finally get on this committee and then I'll be able to make a difference. No, you make a difference and then those are the people you want on the committee, right? Right, and I think it's it's a value for the committees within the church to work with the nominating committee so that they have an idea of what um, different areas. Do you need an area or a person on your finance committee that understands investments and endowments and that type of thing so that they can say maybe see beyond the budget? Or do you have somebody that is um, connected very well with the other programs within your church so that they can bring those points of view and the love for those ministries to the finance committee as well. So work with the nominating committee. Yeah. Um, I love this quote from John Cotter. Change is difficult to accomplish. No one individual can get it done. A weak committee is even worse. Yeah. So if you have that weak committee, then it just becomes a mundane activity that you have to go to each month. But what is coming out of that committee that is energizing your, your church and your congregation? Exactly. So many of you will recognize this. This is I googled uh, church parlor, and this is normally the one that uh, the ladies of the church maintain. It's always white carpet, white furniture. That's how mine was at Legacy. I remember that. And uh, the biggest fear of those ladies that care for this room, <laughs> Kool Aid. <laughs> so, so, and how this ties in is. I really do have to ask if any of you have this has actually been a policy in some of the church policies that red Kool-Aid cannot be served <laughs> at an event or an activity. Did you know that? I, I can see that. I've uh, actually seen it in church policies. It, it seems like it's a policy that there has to be white carpet in church parsonages too, <laughs> which I don't know what the heck is up with that. So, well, it's cheap because nobody else is putting it in anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll tell it anyway, but and we can cut it out if we want to. But uh, we had a white. We lived in a parsonage, and my daughter, at about two or three years old, she grabs the strawberry syrup out and she draws her. She just draws circles all over the white carpet, and I'm just like, no. <laughs> and so we felt so guilty. We bought ourselves our own steam cleaner just so we could steam clean. But anyway, um, if you want a young family, don't have white carpet and, but that's the the what the fear we're going to talk about is just like bringing in kool-aid into the parlor you feel stupid because that is a common fear is that you're it's not in your expertise if you're a pastor to understand the numbers usually or if you're new to the finance committee looking over the church finances for the first time it's easy to feel stupid um, easy to feel underqualified and um, that that doesn't help anything move forward so here's my tips on how to not feel stupid. One is remember what your role is. Now, this is the, probably the most important one. If you're a pastor, you don't have to pretend to be a financial whiz if you're not. If you're a newcomer to the finance committee, you don't have to pretend that you know everything. Your role as a pastor is to hopefully be the gas pedal in this, to be the vision, um, and, and that's fine. They, they might apply the brakes, but again, if you never apply the gas, you're not going to go forward. So th that's their role. If you're a newcomer, your role is to learn. Um, that's part of your role. And uh, some people in the finance committee, just like what Sherry was saying, they got their niche. So what is your niche? You know, you can learn about other areas, but what is your niche that you that we're counting on you to fulfill? The other one is people get afraid to, are afraid to ask questions. So ask questions. Um, I'm going to tell you that this is a little known secret in finance committees is that there really is only one or two people that actually understand the church finances. So you ask a question and look at where who people are looking at, and they they'll automatically turn their heads to the one person that really does know, and that's fine. I mean, but ask questions, and you'll get the the pat answer first. So what you need to do is then ask follow-up questions. Um, I remember uh, Sherry when she came on board and she asked me what we did with investments and I, or what we did with the money we, we received. And I said, we invest it. Well, that is the pat answer. We invest it. We get a return on our money. But really, what do we do with it after that? What well, did, I, I, yeah. did I stop with that question? No, you didn't stop. And, but, I mean, it forced us to think, really. And that, that was the question where it went from just operational to now more strategic what do we do with it and it, that that's applying the gas in a lot of ways so 
And then there's some things too. We we know the simple answer, but we haven't thought about it in a long time. And sometimes we just need need to question what we thought we believed. Um, and then the third one is you you really should try to learn the basics of reading a financial statement. And I want to just go over some quick tips that if you're a novice to finances, this is what I look at as an accountant. This is what I look at when I get a financial statement. I First of all, I look at the bottom line. So this uh, financial statement on the far left is the month to date. The middle is the year to date and the end is the, the budget. But I look at the bottom line and I can see that year to date, we're $25,000 ahead, you know, $25,000 surplus you know that tells me where we're at so even if the the, the copier but is going over by 500 bucks you know we're not in trouble apparently according to this um the and there's also more than one bottom line usually so another thing i'll do is i'll glance up normally there'll be a summary for how the youth is doing how admissions is doing how finance and stewardship or how trustees are doing and again, I normally look at the bottom line, and if the bottom line is fine, if it's within budget like these ones are, I normally don't worry then about double checking all these individual ones because again, it's uh, as long as they're overall within their budget, that's fine. And as a committee, if you give the responsibility to the, your church leaders, your pastor, your youth leader, then that's where they come in to make sure that they manage that piece of it, that you bring the vision for the overall budget. Exactly. Um, then the other thing I do, and this is uh, taken from the balance sheet side, but I compare last year to this year. And I would do the same thing for expenses, too, and, and income, as I would compare this year to last year, because that, that's a lot more telling in a lot of ways. If you're at the end of September and you're – let's just say slightly negative in your, you have more expenses than income, but if, that might be a concern unless that's the way it always is. And you always catch up in October, November, and December. So there's, there's ways to think about this last year versus this year. And then looking at those bottom lines, that'll, that's part of the key for being able to read them really quick. And, um, be coming with better questions then, because then I could ask, even on this one, I could see that cash is down quite a bit. Why was cash down quite a bit? And actually this year we had a large uh, trustees expense and that was the reason. And so then you can just kind of log that in away and you know the answer. And don't ever hesitate to call the office. And especially in these areas, ask Jeff for, um, Jeff has a CPA background and he, can bring all of these financial terminology, all the terms, all the things you hear down into the lay level, lay leader level, and um, and talk to it as a as a person, yeah. <laughs> and not get caught up in the numbers part and in, in the terminology for finances. So do not hesitate and call Jeff for this because he does a really great job of helping people understand these terms. Well, thanks. Um, our third year is that sometimes you show up at the meeting and it feels like you've done this before. If any of you guys uh, recognize this, this is from uh, Groundhog's Day. I think that was released in 1993, Bill Murray, great video. So, But that is it, that I'm stuck in a time loop. And Sherry, you had a great story. That <laughs> at a previous um, job that I worked at, I worked with a leader that wasn't necessarily a great leader of moving his committees. And I was in charge of putting together the agenda. And to prove a point, I used the same agenda three months in a row. I just changed the date. And what we found was that he never even understood that it was the same agenda. And once we talked about it after my little test of the three months in a row, we talked about how to move that forward then um, because we were absolutely on a treadmill. We we didn't have a pedal and we didn't have a brake. We were on a treadmill going absolutely nowhere. And it felt like we were going through the motions, but we were going absolutely nowhere. <laughs> so how many times, think back on your committees, how many times have you discussed the same things over and over? Um, and have you ever been on a committee where they said, when you have new business, and somebody says, I thought we talked about that last month. Yeah. Well, if you talked about it last month, it's no longer new business. Yep. So yep. Um, think about that. How are you moving that committee forward? 
And then some of the operational management practices, um, this is where it becomes the leadership of the church to really dig into this more so than even the committee. But for the committee to be aware that these are some of the responsibilities of the leadership versus the committee. So is the leadership bringing to you a clear mission? What is your mission of the church? What do you stand for? And what are you proud of that you can tell people that you're doing in your community? And then a narrative budget to your congregation rather than a line item budget. The narrative budget puts it into perspective of where your dollars are going for the ministries and the programs within the church. And then um, an annual giving program, and we talked about your own stewardship in the past. And so if you have questions on how to do that, please don't um, hesitate to call. But has your leadership put a year-round stewardship um, program into place? Um, then I think one of the other areas that is so important is the celebrating and the recognition. Yeah. Celebrate. Um, are you excited about the fact that you've made budget or that you're you're starting a new program because you've had some dollars that you've designated to a new program or a new ministry and celebrate those things and thank people um, on a continuing basis for their giving and for their support of your church and your ministries. Because these are good ideas to help you get out of the rut. You know, and a lot of times you talked about celebrating. I mean, I, I have sat on very few finance committees that actually had goals. So, I mean, what are you celebrating if you don't have a goal? You know, or it, it's one of those things where that that's a, also a piece of it, you know, getting the mission involved into your thinking as a finance committee and then also setting goals and celebrating. So. Right, and when you're taking the offering during worship, what what feel do you have with the offering? Yeah. Is the music exciting? Is it a great time, or is it going through the motions and passing the plate? Yeah. We want to get away from that and celebrate. Here we are giving our gifts to God. Exactly. And how are we thinking when we get to the meetings? Is it abundance or is it scarcity? And if we can go into our meetings with the the attitude of abundance, it will you will be surprised of how much easier it is to discuss what's going on in the church than that fear of scarcity of oh no, if we don't have enough, what are we going to do? Um, and then are you asset based, um, talking about the great things that are going on, or need based? Are you constantly talking about how are we going to turn the lights yeah. on? And then creation over redistribution, are you just moving the dollars around from place to place, or are you finding ways that new creation and new opportunities are happening? And then is this happening from committee to committee to committee, or are you just thinking about the finance committee? Because yeah. you want to think about the whole church and, and everything that's going on as a, a whole unit, rather than just concentrating on the budget and the in the bottom line. And again, it's just like the gas pedal and the brake. It, each one has their importance. You're part of the, there's a reason why the finance committee is there. It's an important piece, but it's important to help further the mission, not just to, uh, not just to stop everything or anything. Right. So, um, it's also important, I think, with the finance committee, a lot of times we get stuck that in our understanding of how money and the church works and we think it's our job to make sure we don't lose any dollars that you know that we try to spend or not spend as carefully as we can um, and we just try to manage well that that's not necessarily an entirely full understanding of what the the scriptures teach on money I mean there's also ideas on how to spend it I mean there's the one guy that hid his uh, talent in the ground and he was um, he was ac actually rebuked by Jesus. You know, the other people that invested it, they spent it and they got a return. That was important. Um, how we regard it, you know, uh, do we regard it as a tool for for the Lord to do the work or how or do we regard it as our own that we have to uh, kind of uh, squirrel away? Um, and how we acquire it to, I mean, there's this whole idea of money we need to get it clear in our mind that that money can be a roadblock to our discipleship, or if we teach it properly and we have a more full understanding, it, it's really a springboard for our discipleship. So, uh, 
The next one is dimensions of religious giving. And this is one where, again, we're talking about where does the finance committee get caught up? We, we get caught up on what's the annual budget appeal? What is, uh, what is this just going through the offering plate? And that's kind of at the lowest level, but there are a number of ways that actually, um, people give and people relate to the church. Um, so that's the very, the very lowest is we're obligated to give. And then there's the more program, programmatic ministries where they got a relationship where people are supporting it. They're involved. They're not just attending and giving out of obligation. They are involved and they're giving to the places where they're seeing the most fruit out of it. And then the third one is there's transformative giving. And there, you'll notice it in certain people when their life has been so touched, their giving changes and their attitude towards money changes. And they're, they're the ones that are setting up their will to support the ministries that they care about the most. They're the ones that are, are giving because they just know that it's going to make a big difference. So it's not giving out obligation. It's not giving because they're involved in it personally. It's giving because they want to further the whole mission. And then if we talk about the narrative budget versus the ministry-based budget, uh, or a narrative budget is another way to say ministry-based budget. It's not um, one or the other. And it communicates all of that complex financial information into a broader sense so that people sitting in your pews and people that you are connecting with and talking with about what's going on in your church have a better understanding of where those dollars are going. Not light item by light item, but what some of those ministries are costing you and how people are supporting those individual ministries. And then it links the vision and the values. So if you have a narrative budget, you're talking about what is the vision of your church and what are the values of the ministry and where are your priorities? Um, once you lay out a narrative budget, you might find that something that your church really has no interest in doing anymore is still being fed by the budget. Yeah. And if you look at a narrative budget, you can see where the energy is. Maybe it's the children's area or maybe it's the um, community um, work that you're doing versus something you've done forever. Um, and, and those are ways that you can sort of streamline those budgets and remove some of those from the, from the budget light items. Good luck. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's not always easy, but the, the narrative budget will show you where your priorities are. You know, and I would, I just, this thought occurred to me. The reason why a narrative budget is so important, it, it'll link, it'll get you guys on the same page between the people that are the gas pedal and the people that are the brake. I mean, it helps you understand where you're going. So, well, and it helps that, you know, these kind of all overlap a little bit in, in each one of these, but it helps with that understanding of stewardship. Where are you stewarding your dollars and where are you working with people to help them understand where your, your um, priorities are within your congregation? Um, and then this, this can bring it right down into the offering. And, you know, we don't want you to get away from the fact that the offering is being taken and that you have an offering every Sunday because that is such an important spiritual piece of your worship service. But how are those contributions and how are they making a difference? So earlier when I said put some excitement into that, um, one of the things that really works well in some of the churches is that they highlight right before the offering something exciting that's happening within the congreg or within your church ministry brings a little bit of light to the offerings and why you're taking it it's a reminder that your the dollars you give is changing lives and it's also changing your life as well i mean it's two things happening right. and then this just shows an expression of faith as the as the dollars go up and the people give more freely to the to the offering and to other areas of the of the needs of the church. Um, Sherry was able to find a couple of good examples, uh, and th these are just the short part of the example. The one on the left is just one section. You saw the sections earlier of the budget I shared with you, the line item budget, you know, it, it, but it explains, it, it gets down to the why are we doing this? Why are we doing worship 
in music? Well, and it, it talks a little bit more about what all happens there. The one on the right is even more simplified. And I do like the idea of using even pictures because the pictures, it, it just puts a face on it. It's not just, um, and honestly, if you, you can't find a picture, <laughs> maybe there's nothing worth sharing on that. Maybe you shouldn't be doing that ministry any longer. But one of the fun things about the pictures is that it will create conversation about the energy with the energy within your church because if you didn't realize somebody was going to camp or that they were working in a community ministry that you had and the picture shows that it gives people in the pews an opportunity to visit with the people who have had that experience all right well we thank you for joining us and listening uh, you can find us online at dakotasumc.org or dakotasumf.org and uh, we hope this has been helpful. And if you have any questions at all, please do not hesitate to call us and we would be glad to help you with the information that we know or direct you in a place where someone else can give you the information. So have a great week.